Okay. Well, it is Thursday, April 21st, uh, 2022. Wow, it's been a while since we've all been here. All of us who are at the kitchen table, welcome to another uh, series in conversation with us through the Men and Masculine Folks Network out of Men as Peacemakers, our parent organization in Duluth, Minnesota, with men from Minnesota who are having conversations about how to navigate uh, and practice healthy masculinity within our own lives and lives of the relationships that we have with other people. My name is Peng, he and his, and I'll let the other folks here uh, introduce themselves again just so that everybody knows. Uh, Roderick Southall, he, him. In hearkening from uh, hearkening from um, Golden Valley, Minnesota. Uh, Serrano Robinson here. You see him, hence pronouns. Um, really good to see y'all. I feel like for me specifically, it's been a while. So great to see y'all and be back. Um, and I'm out of Duluth, Minnesota today. Definitely echoing that. Uh, excited to be here. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Hayes. My pronouns are he, him, and his. Also coming to you live from Duluth, the Northland, uh, where we saw the sun for most of the morning, and it was just like filling my soul. Uh, we've had some weird weather up here with snow and rain and like, what season are we in right now? <laughs> but yeah, glad to be here with all y'all. Very awesome, thank you. And as always, we mix those who aren't here with us, Felix, um, who consistently shows up as well too, uh, and Ed Eisler, who is here, here and there at times. We miss those folks as well too. But most of all, we miss this space and being together in this kind of a way. Uh, Sean and I were uh, in person about two, three weeks ago, I should say. And that was a while, and we were doing a live session from our summit in Minneapolis, uh, and we were doing physical practice, and so we were live for a short period of time. Um, and actually, we accidentally got on the wrong live feed, so we were able to recorrect that. Uh, so apologies if you were hoping to join us live and you didn't through our Facebook page and couldn't, so our apologies there, but we will ensure that hopefully that does not, technology does not do that to us again, or we look at it properly the next time around. And as always, this is a platform that this is a platform for hopefully for you all to carry the conversations into your own homes, into your own neighborhoods, con church congregations, religious institutions, um, groups of people that you're with, particularly for men and masculine folks to really have these kinds of conversations that we're having here, like parallel it, take from the conversations, take the learning, we should say always, the learning is always um, welcome to be taken, but the stories stay with the people, right? Because the people own those stories. So any of the stories that we share are owned by any of us who are having this conversation. And for any of you who are having this conversation with us at this moment, and as always, we welcome people to give feedback and chime. So I just wanted to sort of preface why we continue to have these conversations, because we believe that in the visibility of these kinds of conversations and the visibility of men and masculine folks being able to have these kinds of conversations with one another as well too. And obviously these conversations are very organic. We don't plan them ahead of time. We plan them as what we are seeing happening in community or um, in the environment at the moment or in society at the moment. And we take that and we really have that conversation from a place of like as men, and masculine and people who are practicing and wanting to practice healthy masculinity and healthy manhood in our own lives. How do we do that with a sense of purpose? How do we do that with, sense, with good goals, with good impact in our community and, and continuing to nurture, right? The relationships that we have. Uh, so in that, it has been a moment since we've all been in this sort of format and configuration. So we're just gonna just see how people are doing um, and what's been up in people's lives, how people have been navigating things. Um, and to Sean's point, we've been having weird weather. So for sure that has taken people in different routes and paths. Um, and then after that, I think we were gonna have a conversation or think about having a conversation with sexual violence because 
April is Sexual Violence Awareness Month, so it is very important for us as many masculine folks to continue that conversation. We've done it a few times already, uh, but that doesn't hurt for us to actually revisit that conversation again because it's not only a one conversation, one time only, it is conversation that is ever evolving. So that is why we have these conversations, is the evolving conversations on them. Um, so I'll leave it there and I'll see who wants to share up just, just to see where you're at, what's been happening, what's going on in your life before we start the conversation with sexual violence. Yeah, I can go because I feel like yeah, it's been a it's been a definitely a while for me. Um, I don't even know when's the last time I've been in a kitchen table conversation, low key. Um, but I've been okay all in all. I've been good, and I've also been like in a little like uh like transition for myself. Um, I ended a a couple of months short to three year relationship that for me was like. It was really good, but it wasn't like really healthy for me in the time being. So with that, it's coming like all the emotions that like I set out to feel. Um, I was talking to Sean about that. Like I'm one, I'm somebody who's like now being better at being big at feeling the things that come with that. Like every emotion that comes with it. Um, you know the the the, the happiness now of like choosing that, but also like the sadness of like having somebody you used to love and you probably still have love for, like not be around anymore. Um. You know, I was even telling Sean, like, it's it's like weird, like, even when you choose it, it comes with hurt, right? Like, normally, like, when you're the one that, like, um, is being broken up with, like, you assume that, like, you know, obviously the person is, like, you know, sad and those things, like, but I'm learning, like, even when it's your choice, it's like, you have to, you go through the same grieving process. And that's what I'm going through um, in a good way and in my way, for sure. Um, I was telling Sean that, like, one thing I'm noticing is, like, I'm going through that like that period of loneliness where it's like not that you missed a person, but it's like you're realizing now that you're like it's a period to where I'm adjusting to being back to myself, like being alone and stuff like not alone, but being single. Um, I think that alone will really just be thrown like a <laughs> like a, it throws like more darkness than it's supposed to. Um, but I'm going through that transition of like, well, you know, waking up, you know. And nobody's there, you know, coming home from work or coming home from basketball or something. And there's not immediately somebody there to, for you to talk to, you know, where you get excited and you have that person you want to talk to or that person you want to go and, like, share that moment with. There's nobody there. So I think I'm going through that form of loneliness, like, not loneliness where I'm like, oh, I want this person back because I've crossed that off, like, in a good way, too. Um, but that loneliness of, yeah, going back to doing those things, like, by yourself for the time being, you know. Um so that's what I'm on right now. It's just like a nice little journey. Um, just feeling all the emotions, like the ups and downs, the feelings of loneliness at times, and also the feeling of like who I am now. Like I'm, one, I'm somebody who understands that we change, we, re, we reinvent. Um, I'm 26 now. So what am I, who am I to move forward at this moment? Like, and I love that part of it. Like I've been so happy, like figuring out like who I'm going to be moving forward because I'm like, you've learned certain shit and you adjust from how you learned. So I'm just excited to like, to 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 get in the point where I'm fully fully seeing like this new me and this new not even this new me but this new version like coming out of the sun. So I would say I'm on my way right now. Like seeing the sun coming out, it's feeling good. But I'm also still feeling like the yeah the sense of like yeah of course a couple of weeks ago shit not a couple of weeks ago now but like a month ago or a month and a half ago um, I was with somebody every day and I was sharing physically emotionally financially things with somebody every day so just getting used to like being like by like yourself or or being single in, in a sense so that's kind of like been me um but diving back into like reading books just doing because i also had to say that i had to limit myself a lot of things for a lot of different reasons um that we won't go into because it's not specifically about this this conversation um but i definitely had to like i thought that that was love for me was limiting parts of myself limiting things of myself for other people and I'm saying that it's not right because I'm like, I'm in the gym more and I'm loving that shit. I'm a lot more happier. I'm on the court more as in basketball and I'm loving it. I'm a lot more happier. I'm able to read more and I love it. I'm a lot more happy. I'm able to like play games or do things that I love a lot more and I'm happy for that. So I would say I'm definitely dealing with like the, the general loneliness of adjusting back to being single and also the happiness of, uh, of who am I becoming in this moment in time. So.
Thanks for that. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful journey that, uh, that, um, yeah, that people, that people have to go through. Um, huh. So I, um, I, uh, I'm doing good. It's been, uh, when I, when, when, when I saw you guys for the first time, uh, uh, today, I was like, um, uh, I've been good. I've been just, you know, I've been in sort of that period where I feel like I've just kind of been focusing on like what literally is right in front of me, right? It's almost like, okay, work, meeting, you know what I'm saying? Just like really seriously, uh, uh, just right in front of you. And I think that, um, uh, I think that's, you know, necessary and good. But I do think that it it uh, that there was a noticeable lack of the space in this conversation um, in that period. Um, I did uh, I did get to travel a little bit, and so I got to see. Um, I got to wonder about. It. I didn't get me really to see because uh, I went to Egypt to see um, the relationships amongst men in the context of that society and, and, and long for a conversation like this uh, there um, because it, the, the, how men are around each other there is very different. Um, not, well, you know, pretty different because it's just every place, right? And so I wonder, you know, what that means for their health, what that means for the health of their families and their children. Um, but again, I was touring so I didn't really get to have those conversations. And so when I was there, I was like, huh, I wonder what, how this conversation would happen with a group of men from there. So that was the journey I was on uh, while we were apart. Whoa, yeah, that's that sounds like a pretty amazing experience uh, for you to go through there, Roderick. Uh, and I really, I don't know. I like your your word of or your use of the word wonder. Like I wonder about that, and also just like I don't know. Something about that felt really good to hear from you because it's like just thinking a lot about uh, folks who have different experiences than me uh, in the last couple of weeks, and and doing I don't know, just trying to get curious about that. So yeah, the wondering. That's what I I want to be wondering more about people in their lives. So. Uh, for me, uh, the last couple of weeks have, gosh, been a struggle. I'll be real. Uh, you know, I, I had a blast being down in Minneapolis with the folks who were able to be there at the summit. That was amazing and such a, such a good space to be in with, with the people who were there and the conversations we had and, and then, uh, Basically, our whole family got COVID uh, shortly after that. So, uh, well, not, I shouldn't say the whole family. Uh, me and Amy and my wife both got COVID, tested positive. And, and so, yeah, a lot of sick time. You know, our, our kiddo couldn't be at daycare. We had to isolate. For part of that, I was isolated because I tested positive first. So I was like living in our basement alone for a couple of days, which... You would think as a newer parent, like having some space and quiet would be lovely, <laughs> but not, no, it wasn't, it wasn't great. And I definitely was missing being with my family. So then, you know, it was like a bummer that Amy also tested positive, but then we could at least like be together and then, you know, and we were able to, you know, mask and do all the things we could so that Eleanor never got sick and um so that was great but then she did get sick the next week so this week I've been dealing with um I've been on my own because my wife traveled home to Michigan uh to be with family and and to be at a family funeral and um yeah so single dadding it this week with a sick kid uh, I also still have some like cold symptoms happening. So it's been a challenge, but uh, just really grateful for like my people who have come through in big ways and dropped off care packages. And like my mom took Eleanor yesterday for the whole day. So I just 
like basked in the quiet, you know, aloneness. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's, it's been a challenge, but it's also, there's been so, so many beautiful moments and like just constantly being reminded of like, gosh, we've got a lot of great folks around us who care and are really like showing that care in tangible ways that feels really good. You know, I was, I was wondering if like, I was thinking about both of what you both said in terms of like the sort of having someone there to share things with um, and kind of how that absent, right? And then the other piece about sort of being in the basement and hearing, right? Hearing, right? Have the, having that really like, I know they're up there, they're doing stuff. I'm, you know, just what that does, what those two kind of situations does to one sense of, um, self right and 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 what it does to one sense of independence if you will right uh sort of spiritual kind of independence right that sort of uh not meant to be alone if you will right yeah it is it is something to actually like such a, it could be like such a contrast to one another, but yet at the same time to what you're sharing, Roderick, is that it could be like this combustion of energy that I'm seeing at the same time as you're talking about it as well too, in terms of that parallel and where it actually can actually intersect as well too. Um, so I'm glad that you are well and that your trip was safe, uh, Roger. Uh, it feels like a, like a, I was like just looking at the date again, and I was, and it just hit me, dawned on me that it's been like a month since the summit. So it's been a month since we have uh, came back from the summit and we did a live there, uh, and so it's just like the three four weeks that had passed by it was just flew, just flew, and April flew by too. Uh, so I, I'm just like, wow, what happened? What took place in all those three weeks? Um, an amazing time at the summit. I wish that the weather was different, obviously. We talked a, bit, a little bit about that differently. I think that, that um, I'm, I'm probably ready as all of you are in some ways in shape and form for the sun to stay out longer and for the sun to be here and it to be warm here. And for spring to finally be here, hopefully, and to stay with us so it doesn't change our lives too much. I, I think it does do something to us in our bodies when we pay attention in that respect to how nature moves us. Uh, so I've been feeling some of that, uh, feeling the uh, quickness of the weeks and, and the days um, since April started. You know, um, April is uh, my birthday month you know, for those who celebrate it every day. <laughs> I don't. Uh, it's fascinating to me how we just started celebrating it when, uh, when I was like, I think 12 or 13, we started celebrating birthdays in my family, in my native family. And but prior to that, and we didn't ever do Christmas prior to that, we didn't ever do birthdays prior to that as well too. So Birthdays weren't ever like a big deal uh, for me. So what I do oftentimes on my birthdays, I just ask people to come, uh, families mostly, to come and hang out and have dinner or whatnot, where I do all the cooking. Uh, and, and so that's what happened. And that was really good uh, for me. And obviously, I'm getting older. And I'm like, what the heck? And, you know, the days go faster and everything. So I'm like, oh, Lord. You know, um, and, and then you have to care for your health more. So I've been thinking about that a lot more in terms of both physical health too. Uh, and, and then there's a really funny story, but I don't know when I'll share it. I'll share that story some other day uh, that I thought I was going to die, but it wasn't that. It was something. So I'll share it some other day uh, and time. And yeah, my family has been doing well. My baby's been sick the last two days, uh, my 17 month old. So he's been having a runny nose um, and he's, and which makes him really cranky and he wakes up a lot at night. And so just not being able to have good sleep because caring for him and trying to take out his um, 
you know, and making his nose open so he can actually sleep well at night too. So that's just re more recently in terms of what's been happening more recently. Uh, I look forward to some celebration uh, this weekend of a good friend of mine. Last weekend, I was at a wedding for one of my aunts and uh, they had asked me to give some uh, talk to support their uh, relationship uh, and their the way in which they're getting married, their partnership there. Uh, so that was really helpful as well to, to, be, to be there and to witness that and to think about marriage and love and what all of that means and constitutes so really grounding in that. Um, yeah, so that's been a couple of things that has been happening in, really in my life. Uh, I am, you know, sort of uh, shifting from that uh, and and going to what you were sharing, Roderick, is that I've always often thought about that as well, too, is like how these conversations can actually happen um, in different spaces with different men in different countries, as well as I travel, uh, too, because the way in which I've experienced um, men in different countries is differently as well, too, you know? Um, and, and it would be interesting to see the kinds of conversations that they have there as well, too, uh, and what those dynamics would be. Uh, and so, yeah, I just wanted to share that before we get into the conversation on sexual violence. I know that prior to us going live here, we were really talking about, to some of what uh, Roger was sharing is, how people and what people think of and constitute as sexual violence, right? That there's many different ways in which people think about it and different people have different varying relationships to sexual violence and to what sexual violence is. And then there's like this like sort of um, community and societal level um, thinking about what sexual violence is, right? And oftentimes I will share that oftentimes we think about it, excuse me, of sexual violence from a place of like, the stranger lurking in the bushes in the dark alleys, jumping out at this really innocent and vulnerable woman and pulling her, dragging her, uh, raping her, um, strangling her, dumping her body, like all of those, right? So sort of, um, and, and excuse us because this could be very triggering for those who are listening to us in this conversation as well too. So please do take care of yourselves as we, as we have a conversation on sexual violence um, because it can be very triggering. Uh, so I forgot to preface that. Uh, and, and, and that is oftentimes how we think about it, right? And then what I wanna say is that in my work with people who committed sexual violence is that that is, that is often not the majority of cases, quote unquote, that we see. The majority of cases that we see and which all of you also know that is true is um, it's, it's happening between people we know and, and from people who we know, right? It's not the stranger, it's not the, the dark alleys, not to say that it doesn't happen that way, but, but the majority of the cases happen with the people we know and we, and we love and the people we used to love, the people we're in relationship with, the people that we think we should trust and we think we can trust. So it makes sexual violence such a daunting experience and daunting conversation and challenging conversation to have because of that, because of it happening uh, in such an intimate way and in intimate relationships or in, in relationships that are so close, I should say, with one another. And so I, um, I think to the tolerance point that Roderick and us were talking about earlier, uh, just to get some preface around that or context around that is that um, people think about it because of that, uh, that main narrative that I was sharing earlier, then people have different ways in which they think about what sexual violence is, right? So then there's people who have different ways of relating to and, and saying and believing, most of all, and believing the victims and survivors when they come out, right? So some people may not believe it because it doesn't, uh, the way in which they think about sexual violence is it happens only here and it doesn't happen there. So sometimes you get kids telling that they've been 
touched inappropriately or that they have been abused or sexually abused or violated and adults not believing it, the parents not believing it because it's like that can't happen and your step dad couldn't do that or uncle couldn't have done that, right? Um, so I, I just want to uh, give some context around that um, as well. Yeah, I was thinking as you were sharing there, paying like oftentimes, <clears throat> you know, we we would, you know, I would say most of folks in communities would, you know, have a definition of sexual violence mainly based off of like media and movies and how those things are depicted in in you know the the blockbuster movies that come out. Um, and yeah, that's definitely some folks' experiences. But I think that that was um, maybe one of the most shocking parts of like when I came into starting doing this work and, and really learning about statistics and learning about how this kind of violence shows up in our communities. You know, it's like you grow up and you're like, well, yeah, of course, like rape and sexual assault is wrong. You know, I think a lot of people would be able to say that and agree with that. But like, yeah, I'm really curious about this, this question that we have of like, how do we define it? Because um, it's, it's such a touchy subject, you know, it's very uncomfortable for people to talk about. Uh, we, we can't even like have conversations in this country about healthy sexuality, let alone, you know, talking about violence that happens. And then even like that more nuanced bit about like, this is happening between people that we know and are in relationship with. It's not on that movie. It's happening right here in our neighborhoods, um, in our families. Um, in our workplaces, you know? So like, I, yeah, I guess I'm curious and I'm wondering about that is, um, you know, cause like just then I was thinking about, okay, sexual harassment and violence that people experience on the job. Like we hear about that so many times and yet like there seems to be these different like degrees of like the seriousness of sexual violence, if that makes any sense. Like we know that rape is like the ultimate bad thing. And yeah, that, you know, that is awful. Uh, and I'm also just wondering about like the different ways that it shows up before we get to that, that point. Um, and so, yeah, sexual harassment. And, and I'm just curious, like what, how else does it show up and, and what does it look like? Cause I think, you know, it's really easy to say, well, it's not okay to sexually assault someone, but it's a lot harder to have a conversation about like, uh, you know, um, men in the workplace making crude comments to women and femme identified folks like that, that power differential there, like that stuff that's happening. I feel like that's kind of what will build to where we get to that point of like that really intense violence happening. So just some of the things I was thinking about and wondering um, about and wondering what y'all think. I think it's um I, yeah, it feels like there's a little a bit of a sliding scale between um uh, the 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 inability to hear people and the uh and, and and the way you erase them from the equation and i i relate that a little bit to uh this topic because i i think that uh you know there is there i think there well i think experience have, experiments have sh i think shown how easy it is for people to treat people poorly um if they see other people doing it around them Right, so the line 
that you establish in terms of what, um, what you think is sexual violence is, it seems, in part based on those people who are around you and where they are in relationship to the line and what you feel about them, you know, who you give grace to and who you don't. Um, it's like, um, and that I, I was saying, thinking that that study comes from the study about sort of cheating, which they say you cheat based on kind of who you see at the line, right? And there's always sort of a creeping up to the line. And I think the same thing can be said about um, people's definition of sexual violence and their perpetration of sexual violence, right? Is sort of, I, I think we I think we want to, or I, I sometimes want to sort of make it an individual thing, right? When it really is a contextualized um, uh, uh, a way in which sort of this collective of, of, of men, if you will, and then some women, right, um, move against uh, move against folks. So I think it's really hard, and, and I think for that reason, it's really, it really feels really hard to um, to plug the holes and say don't make it happen, or don't let it happen anymore, because there's just sort of so many ways in which it can show up, um, and in the package of so many kinds of people, right? Well-meaning people, mean people, you know, just it show it can show up in so many um, so many kinds of folks that it feels hard to just find a way to to stop it, if you will. Um, so for, for, for whatever it's worth, I'm always trying to conflate these studies with things, um, but that's what it feels like. It's just, just this whole uh, giving permission um, to folks. Um, and, and, and sometimes when you don't realize it, right, that you're giving permission to folks and that's our silence, um, our attention, our lack of attention, all of that I think can, can provide permission and space. Mm -hmm. And that's like a good question. Like, how do you talk about that? Because I think it's like most like tough subjects where we try to like divide it or we try to like deflate it or make it like smaller than what it is. Like, because people would weirdly talk about like an instance every day, like a fight, sexual, because I see sexual assault as like, and I may be wrong, but in my opinion, it's like an instance of what happened, right? The cop get called and the cop's like, well, but did he hit you? But did he hit you? But did he put it? And it's like, you're not actually listening to what the fuck she's saying is going on. She's giving you the whole blueprint about how he's actually being violent to her. But you're waiting for that, for that home run of did he put his hands on you? Or, and I'm not going to lie, like, in terms of sexual assault, like, I'm going to say this, but again, I, I, I love the fact that you said, like, take care of yourself, Peng, because it's very serious. So I'll echo that. Like, please take care of yourself if you're watching this. In terms of insertion, right? That's where we stop as well. Let's keep it a buck. Let's keep it honest. That is where, and that's the only part where we talk about sexual assault or violence. We're just like, well, did he insert you, or did she, or did they insert? You? And it's like it's, it's you have to think about the steps before that too, and that's sexual violence. So sexual assault is, of course, we could talk about the one-offs all day, the, the isolations. The, oh, it happened in the West one time, and in the East. And when you talk about the, the way of which it's like exactly how a lot of us saying is like coming to happen or it's allowed to be there allowed to be there allowed to be true is the sexual violence like the lead up to it right if me and you were in a relationship and i know that you hit me like it is also violent for you to be like hey go do this right now unless you know what's going to happen that is also violent because i know what's going to happen what's going to happen is more violence but we don't see that we'll see oh no it's all good and all love is fair until he puts his hands on her until they uh, until somebody's physically hurt but violence is also the know, the knowing of what's to come. Like that is also violent. Like the pumping of your, your, your heart and the you can't do anything. That's like, you can't do what you really want to do because you're actually scared. What part of, of that we're we not going to talk about is also being violent. Like that is also inherently in the violent as well. So I think what helps is sadly not talk about it is like the division of like oh sexual assault, sexual violence. But it's it one. It's like a lead up to another. Like sexual violence is the entire 
like relationship, if you will. The entire relationship is built off of that violence, that sexual violence. The person in control, knowing who they are controlling. And that's the biggest part about like what Peng was saying is like, it's not the movies. Media loves to, to screw shit and be like, yeah, it's that dude that nobody knows who just randomly moved to a city and now he's just randomly like, and don't get me wrong, again, I I feel for people who that actually happens to because that is actually what happens to some people. But that's not the that's not the the majority at all. The majority is people who you know how to control because you have to know how to control them to control them. Now, if you find somebody on the first day out of nowhere, that's a flip of a coin whether you can control this person, right? But if you've been with this person sexually, int intimately, in a way to where you know them, then obviously I'm easier. I'm I'm going to be way easier to control who I know versus who I don't know because I know how you're going to respond. I know how to how to get you in ways to not even respond. I know how to get you in ways to respond to to the way that I want to hear it and not the way that you want to hear it. So I think we need to like kind of talk more about like that lead up and what does sexual violence like mean to others? Like education always beats people over there because it's like people are being hurt and you're like, what do you mean education and shit? But it's like to certain degrees, that's really all what we have is to let people know about certain things. Because I'm not gonna lie, like growing up in like you know Bronx those inner cities like it really is about that sadly it's, it's it's until they hit it's until it happens it's not about the he's controlling where she goes and he's controlling who she sees and he's controlling when he's getting his and he's controlling when he's spending the money and he's controlling when he sees the kids that is not violence to people and it's so fucked up because that is violence in reality that is so i think we got to talk about the merging of the conversation of like it is both and like it, it's not an assault no but it is sexual violence to do those things because it leads up to it right if i know for a fact that i'm with somebody and i know that they're gonna do what the fuck i say and i don't have to put my hands on them then obviously i'm gonna do everything else before that and that's so good like we, we forget that i'm still controlling right now not the fact that i didn't put my hands on them but like i literally just said i'm gonna still do everything that i can do to make them believe to make them do what I say before I got to put my hands on them. That is still inherently violent, but we don't understand that. We don't, we don't see that as violent, not as a group, not as a collective, not as a, a basis of itself. We're very reactional in the, cause that's what it is, right? You punch me now. How do we deal with the person that's punched? Right. Instead of like dealing with, how do we even get to the point where we see punching somebody is even okay. Like how the fuck do we get there? Like, how do we get, that because punches like fights happen quick right like the, the 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 exchange of things it happens really quick but the knowing of how we get there is, is never quick it's always there you're always knowing that you can get into a fight you always know what but what things to do what what which ways to, to to move in order to make that happen so i think a lot of have conversations should be before that before you know seeing a lot of like i'm, I'm loving like the the red flags like i don't know if y'all bigger on like social media um, right now, but like, you know, on the s s several platforms, they're like, but not what are red flags and people are even talking about those because even that's even good, right? Like talking about the steps beforehand, like if you're about to go somewhere and, you know, you want to just have fun and you've done everything for the day as a person and you've done your shit, your partner's like, oh, no, you can't go for no reason at all. Oh, that's a red fucking flag. So it, it, like we're, we're coming to that point, but we got to step on the fact of talking more about the, the the prevention like the beforehand because yeah if we're just gonna talk about the reaction it's gonna be very hard like it's gonna be like tough it won't even it won't even feel existent um so I guess yeah that's what I was trying to like get across like the sexual assault because even that confuses me like sexual assault and then sexual violence like assault is like when it ha like what happens or like the the physical aspect of what we know to what happens but the sexual assault is everything under that everything under the sun leading up to that point. Um, I hope like that makes sense because I'm also like in between brains right now. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, uh, Serrano. And I think that you are exactly on point when you're talking about, you know, to some of what Sean was saying and to what Roger was talking about too. The permission giving is we don't understand that the words that we say. Uh, the actions that we do, to Sean's point, leads and allows for people to say, this is okay. This choice is okay, right? Um, so the permission giving is so, so important and, that, um, and understanding that part is really important. It's like how we say yes to certain things in our life 
which without knowing the indirect consequences of that, right? And so we have to be more intentional about it if we're gonna actually stop sexual violence is that we have to, as men in particular, really think about if I took a, guy, a group of guys to a strip club, what does that actually mean? That may be harmless because it's like allowed, but the indirect consequence of that is that it actually contributes to the permission giving of people actually uh, demonizing and um, utilizing uh, the body parts of women uh, and femme folks and female identified people in the way that they want to, right? Or objectifying those body parts in the ways that they want to. Um, and, and, and seeing it as just objects and being able to do with it whatever it is they, they want, right? So those are like the indirect consequences that we actually don't see. The indirect consequences of like young men being exposed to pornography without a conversation appropriately around sex and sexuality is also that permission giving of like, without having the conversation, right? Um, uh, of viewing pornography and understanding that the, the pleasure piece is really uh, that uh, from a cisgender straight perspective is that women are only there to serve, right? And to only give pleasure to men and their male body parts only, quote unquote. Uh, and, and so, and so then he believes that that's what it is, right? And that um, people shouldn't turn him down, right? And that that uh, there should be a desire there for him to actually know and understand how to be in sex, you know? And so if we're talking about it from a very cisgender straight perspective around sexual violence. That's what we are teaching the young men and boys in our community. Uh, if we don't have appropriate conversations around sex and sexuality, and we allow them to actually watch pornography without the conversations, right? Um, or, or do bachelor parties in that kind of way that I was talking about by hiring strippers, uh, because it's a harmless act, right? Um, and I kid you not, you know, people who come to, uh, to treatment, quote unquote, for sexual violence, uh, hiring um, and exploiting people who uh, sell their bodies, quote unquote, um, who are being exploited in that way, they think that it's like two consenting adults. They see nothing wrong with them, right? They, they don't see anything that that's bad, right? They don't see the exploitation part of it. All they see is she said yes to me, that person said yes to me, and I said yes, all is good. We exchanged money. That's the end. There's no, you know, there's no seeing the exploitation part of it or the viewing of child pornography in their own homes, getting to that place of like, I wasn't the one who did it. But the indirect consequences of how that drives the demand for more, the people who are causing the harm directly to continue to cause harm sexually to children, right? And exposing, making sure that children are actually used and utilized in that kind of a way because the market demands it because of that person's viewership or those folks' viewership at home in their own private homes. So we forget about that, right? And, and the ways in which we, uh, the words that we say, right? Um, and that is all permission given. That is all saying that sexual violence is okay. That is all saying that this act of rape when it gets to that place is okay. But what we forget is that I think in society at times or in community at times is that there's a disconnect between, between what we do that we think is harmless because it's been codified and legalized, right? Like we see in Minneapolis with all the uh, adult places, it's been legalized. So there's no harm in that. But we forget that actually 60 to 70% of the women who actually go and become uh, strippers and go and work as sex workers have actually had experiences from sexual exploitation. We forget about that, right? We forget about that 60 to 70 percent that have first experienced it as sexual exploitation in their own lives and then now have become sex workers. Uh, and there's a lot of nuances more than that and I recognize that and I want to share that that I may not be articulating it in the best way but I think those are the things that we have to take into consideration. We really have to think about when we think about 
uh, sexual violence. And so definitely the permission giving. What permission are you giving that's contributing to the violence that is actually happening in our communities? I think my brain just keeps like going like this because the more that I think about it, the more it's like there are so many levels of this and depths to sexual violence. Um, you know, I had one uh, memory come to me, uh, you know, like paying and I think others here have said like, you know, the, th the things that we say, the words that we say matter, like even on that like lowest level of like, if I'm someone who, and I was someone who was, uh, you know, repeatedly using the word rape in a silly joking way, like that was something that I had been doing when I was in my early to mid twenties, <clears throat> like saying things like, um, gosh, I, I hate to even say this, but like something where it's like, you know, like, oh, that that car salesman raped me with that price of that car. Uh, things like that, you know, using words like that, that are awful things that happen uh, and that minimizing it and turning it into a joke. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about that because I, you know, and I was in circles at that time where many people, women and men, were using that, that term in that way. And I remember uh, my wife hearing me say something like that. And uh, we were in our home together and it was just us. And she was like, whoa, stop what you're like, cut me off. Uh, and I think it was the first time she had sort of heard me use that word in that joking way. And she was like, dude, this is not okay. Like, think about that, what you're saying, what that means. Uh, and so it's, I don't know, it was shocking. And it was like, well, I don't, I don't mean it in that way. Well, yeah, but like, who are all of the people who heard me jokingly say that out in the community, out at the bar with my friends, like playing volleyball at this thing or that, you know, and like, that is me giving permission to others who are looking at me and being like, oh, Sean uses that and it's a joke and it's just fine. Like, no, that's a hard stop. Uh, and, you know, it's like, I think there's a part of me where it was like, I didn't realize that. Like, I didn't, I wasn't intentionally, you know, using this in a way to be harmful towards people, but I hadn't actually done that deeper thinking and that deeper feeling of like, what would that sound like from someone who has been raped and is a survivor of sexual violence and happened to hear me say that? I mean, the, the continued harm then that I'm causing that person, right? Like we don't know folks experiences who are around us and, and the way that we show up and the way that we talk about these things really does matter, uh, but it's not easy. Like it is not easy to go deeper than just like rape is bad. Yeah, that's that's really easy for us all to agree on. But like when people start calling us to account for like our language and the ways that we take up space and like the ways that I may talk over a femme identified person in a meeting, like what are these things saying? It's saying that I don't value that person. It's saying that, you know, hey, that's okay for someone else down the road to not value that person and and um and that's tough. That's a lot that I'm kind of sitting with in this moment. Um, but it's like, it's a lot for survivors and victims to experience this violence and then to have to like continue surviving and living their lives after experiencing something so traumatic. Uh, so it's the least that I, that we can do to think about the words we say and, and the ways that we are contributing, even if we think we're the good guys uh, you know, we still contribute to this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like the education of like empathy as well. Because I think it's like to respond to some of what you were saying, Sean, it's like, it's not hard because like you're a demon or like a terrible person and you're like having to like, you know, un 
you know, take off all your demon feathers and wings and shit. It's like it's it's hard because of like what we know right now. It's hard because of what we're used to. It's hard because of like everything that's been told to us up until this point. So I think the encouragement too is like not to like because I think that's what's fearful too is like when we get fearful of something, we're like, oh, is this gonna deem me a bad person? All right, fuck it, I'm just not gonna do it. And that's also like that's also like vi- not violent, but it's like it's a step towards it because you're allowing like the neglect of the conversation to happen. So I love like you talking about having a have that conversation and like going deeper because like that's what we have to do. And it doesn't mean that it's like and I love the fact you said it's gonna be hard because to explain again why it's going to be hard it's not hard because we're like we want this to exist and we're like awful people who like you know do these things on the regular but it's going to be hard because sometimes one of the hard things one of the the tough things are hard for us as human beings when we think about change and we think about new things in general it's always like inherently hard but for the shit that we want we got to do it so why is this anything less than the shit that we want like as humans, why is this anything less when it's like sports related or anything else? We, we come together real quick to collect it to understand <laughs> like simply what that means and the hard work we gotta do, right? So like what what does that mean for us like, you know, to 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 do that hard work? Um and I really love what you said about like the language because like, you know, it all seems like literally like funny, you know, until like somebody who's actually been through it is in your face like, no, that's actually not funny, bro. Like do you actually understand like what that means of what you're saying? And again, it comes back to like you know the education of empathy because we all want to get to the point where we're like, yeah, fuck that, fuck the other person, like hit somebody who's acting like that. But it's like it really does come down to like what they do and they don't know, right? Like it does. Do they actually know that that's really really harmful, or have they been around people who have like like you said allowed them to be that to be cool? I love the fact that you were around your wife and she like stopped like a habit because that means she loved you more than the habit itself. She could have allowed you to be comfortable as fuck, kept saying it and kept doing it and kept, but she loved you more than itself the way she was like, nah, let me stop this. Let me help him understand like what this actually means. Cause that's what it comes down to too, is having people understand like that that shit is not funny at all. Like, and sadly it takes the most people for it to happen to them or somebody close to them. And obviously that is not our answer either. Cause I was talking uh, like on a previous call, like, the other thing I know is like is when the shit happens to you and you're like, oh, now I understand it. But that's not also positive either. So what's below that is like the deep, like hard, like tough, like just education, like being able to sit there, listen, even when it doesn't like apply to you, like the good guy mentality. Like just because you haven't physically put your hands on somebody doesn't mean you don't have to listen to this education. Doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to you. It applies to you. Like the same way, if anything, that it applies to people who do that because like that is not just a surface level like thing like you said it's very surface level to be like yep i don't do that (laughs) like let's just move on but hurt harm that's not surface level for anybody like that is for people so as people that want to like do the education and want to do the work like we got to go deeper in ourselves too like not just the assault but what is the actual violence mean like what is the the code yeah if, if you sadly not like lack a better term what is the code of violence that we have to like understand why it exists to them and then help them decode it at the same time you know i think um just because i know we're closing on time here but just some of my closing thoughts, it's just some of what Sean is sharing here is that this can be, we're not telling people that you need to like all of a sudden be like careful about everything that you do. And you do need to at the same time too, right? Um, and not everybody is going to be uh, good. But if you're claiming to be a good person in the world, behave in a way that is intentional, is more intentional. Be more accountable of all your words and actions and thoughts and think a little bit more. That's all we're asking is just think a little bit more about the impact of what you're saying, of what you're doing, of what choices you're making, because it could keep allowing for the violence to actually happen in our community, right? That's all. It's not about like, I think even in these conversations, it's not about like all of a sudden people need to be perfect. All of a sudden you need to be watching out on everything and be politically correct all the time. We know it takes time. And it's an evolving process. And I think that that's why we use this platform as a way for us to say, how do we keep practicing? How do we keep practicing? Because we know we're not there. None of us are. 
Um, but how do we keep practicing and how do we keep being responsible and how do we keep being accountable in ways that are going to lessen the impact of the ways in which we move around our experiences as men and masculine folks in our lives, right? And I think that that's what I want to leave folks with is for me and my end is like who, who've been doing this work for a very long time and folks can feel very overwhelmed at this and they, they just leave it at to Sean's point that rape is wrong only or don't hit women and that that's good. But we have to go deeper in understanding that part, especially to the part where Roger was talking about in terms of permission, right? Be more intentional in our lives, uh, be more thoughtful, be kind, like really be kind in our lives is really the practices that we will have to practice. So just leave us there so that people don't get so overwhelmed too for those who are listening. Roger Serrano, do either of you have any kind of last thoughts and then I can take us out? I would just echo, echo, echo that everything that's been said today, um, but particularly at that last bit that Payne talked about, just echo it, let it reverberate in your head for a bit. Yeah, I agree too. And like specifically, like that shit really blew my mind. I'm not gonna lie. Like if you really do care and you say you're a good person, like really move intentionally for sure. Like think about your steps three, four steps down the road, like because that really shows that you give a fuck. So I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. I think uh that that reminder of like yeah we're not expecting folks and like i don't expect myself to like bam snap my fingers and i'm like this perfect good guy who never causes harm because i you know i think i cause harm all the time uh and you know at the same time i also care a lot and i try to bring joy and and i think that's what all of us are are doing and um and one final thought that i was thinking about there is like you know it was hard for me to stop using rape in that way. I would find myself continuing to do it and then kind of catching myself. Um, and so it is, it's really about that practice of like, this is a habit that now someone has like opened my eyes to that I can work on. Um, and also I just like, like what helps me is like thinking about the people who are around me who now feel safer and feel heard and feel like like I care enough to make a change so that they can actually feel good and safe and valued and and um, like a whole human being who doesn't have to tiptoe around me and and the words that I'm saying you know so it's like just thinking about all the people who are around us and like yeah, trying to care for each other, be kind. I think you said it really well there paying uh, intentionally kind so. Uh, I'm very grateful to have been able to get together with all of y'all to have this conversation and thank you to those of you who were able to join us live for this conversation and, and who continue to join us and um, be a part of these conversations and be bringing similar conversations, you know, as we said before, into your workplaces and your homes and your kitchen tables. Um, we really love to hear about folks who are doing that. And, and we have heard stories of many folks who are watching and, and starting those conversations. So we want to encourage you to continue doing that, to ask these questions, to get curious. Uh, and that way we are all together building a safer uh, place for all of us to be our whole, full, beautiful selves. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. We wanna say thank you to our funding partners, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Minnesota, as well as the Novo Foundation. We are very grateful for all of your support uh, in helping us continue to have these kinds of conversations in community. Uh, and as a reminder, we are hosting these conversations every other Thursday. So our next one will be on Thursday, May 5th at 12 p.m. Central Time. So please join us, mark your calendars, grab your lunch, and just turn on our conversation, listen, comment. We want to hear what's going on with all of you and your thoughts. Uh, so we look forward to connecting with you next time. Uh, and until then, take good care, everyone, and be intentionally kind.